Welcome to episode number 49 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Hopefully spring is starting to set in where you're at. Today's supposed to be plus 12 for me, so I'm definitely going to get outside and get some sun for the first time in a long time, it seems like. I'm going to start posting some somewhat regular videos on YouTube, just short sort of 5 to 12 minute videos or so. So if you're interested in seeing those, make sure you go subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you are enjoying the podcast, a 5 star rating on the Apple Podcasting app is always greatly appreciated. And you can also head to animalsathome.ca slash shop to pick yourself up an Animals at Home sweater or t-shirt and $5 does automatically get donated to ARC, which is the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. You can find an affiliate link in the YouTube description or the show notes at animalsathome.ca slash podcast. We actually discuss Custom Reptile Habitats in this episode of the podcast because I am speaking with Rebecca from the YouTube channel Leopard Gecko. I think Rebecca probably has one of the most familiar voices in the reptile trade on YouTube, so it was a pleasure chatting with her. We discuss everything from why she started her YouTube channel and how it has evolved over time. Of course, we discuss leopard gecko care and how to advance your care, including some of the technology she's now using to keep her leopard geckos happy and healthy. We also discuss a big bioactive project that she has recently started with using a custom reptile habitats enclosure, which was really interesting as well. Let's just jump right into the chat. I hope you enjoy it. Well, Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. That's okay. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> you have, I think, one of the most recognizable voices in the reptile hobby, <laughs> and you're simultaneously one of the more mysterious figures as well. So it's an interesting combination. So we're going to get into all that. Of course, you're the voice behind the, the Leopard Gecko YouTube channel. But I, I want to know how this started. It w- was there a story or something that you remember w- what initially got you into reptiles or initially got you into keeping pets? Um, well, I, I've always been obsessed with animals. I've had a soft spot for bugs and reptiles and an amphibians as well, because I always felt like people thought they were gross or weird, but so I always felt like I had to protect them. Um, but I've always been obsessed. Like the first reptile I stroked, I think was a Burmese python when I was four. And I just, yeah, I just fell in love with animals. I always wanted to be a vet or a zookeeper. Um, and of course, I was obsessed with Steve Irwin and David Attenborough. So <laughs> they definitely influenced me as well. So when you, obviously the, the pet or the Burmese python that, that you pet, was that somebody's uh, house pet or was that at a, at a zoo or something? Uh, that was at a zoo. Mm. Yeah. And when did your, the first animals that you acquired come into your life? Uh, so I was about four and we got goldfish. So we, mm. we started off quite simple. That's a good way to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then eventually we got rabbits um, and they were quite a big responsibility. I was about seven and I have two other sisters and each week it was our each person's turn to clean them out. So it taught us quite a bit of responsibility. Um, but I, in terms of having pets, I just had like fish and rabbits for a long time. We didn't have anything really exotic. And then when did the, was, was your first reptile a leopard gecko? Yeah. (laughs) And so tell me the story about that. How did that uh, pop into your life? So I've always been like, I've always not collected, but we had like frogs and newts and stuff in our uh, pond and I used to always raise them. So I was always obsessed with things like that. And I knew I wanted a lizard when I was older. Um, But when I was about 10, I went to a reptile show at a school near me and they basically bought out reptiles, taught you about them. And they handed out a booklet at the end. And in that booklet, there was like bearded dragon, leopard gecko, blue tongue skink and a ball python. And I just got fixated on this leopard gecko and how I wanted one. And from about the age of 10 to 13, I was researching. I was saving my birthday and Christmas money. And eventually I got my first leopard gecko. I think that it's funny how those little moments you have as a child just burn into your mind. You're like, I really want this gecko. And I think you must be probably around the same age as I am. So when you're 10 to 13, it's not like the internet was like it is now. No. Do you remember doing research? Did you, were you doing it on the computer or did you go find some books? Well, I have I had quite a few books. I looked online though. Obviously, YouTube wasn't around then. This is about 2003 to 2006. And um, even the booklet I picked up at that reptile show, everywhere would say, use calcium sand with your leopard geckos. And even the booklet said that leopard geckos only live eight to 10 years. So there was so much misinformation. And 
but everything I read, it was like use Kelsey sand. I go to shops and it was use Kelsey sand. And when I first got my like my first gecko gizmo, luckily the breeder I chose told me you have to avoid this stuff. This stuff is horrible. And I feel like if I hadn't met that breeder, I would have gone down a completely different route because I would have got that gecko. Kelsey sand probably wouldn't last long. And weirdly enough, uh, a friend of the family who saw that I got a lizard and they wanted a lizard, they went to get a leopard gecko from the same reptile shop I've been to, um, where I saw they had Kelsey sand. He followed all their advice, and within the year, that gecko had died. So quite early on, I realised the importance of getting that right information straight away. It, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting and how different your life might have been if you had originally got one, got the Kelsey sand, and then lost the gecko in the first year or two. You might have just been turned off of keeping reptiles. You might have thought, I'm not interested in this. They die too easy. And then Leopard Gecko YouTube channel would have never been a thing. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's just crazy. Like, she taught me so much stuff as well. So I feel like in a way that's, like, I feel kind of like her in that position because there's a lot of younger people a similar age to what I was when I was getting the first my first gecko and they are so I feel that responsibility to point them in the right direction because I know how drastically that can change things Mm. so tell me about the YouTube channel obviously there must have been a few years between your first gecko and starting the YouTube channel why and why did you start the channel in the first place so uh yeah it was about six I've I'd had geckos six years. At that point, I had three geckos. I was about to get my fourth. And it was quite a few different things. Obviously, I've mentioned my anxiety. I couldn't really leave the house, but I really wanted to work with animals. I'd studied photography and I'd also done uh, extra Uh, studies for like animal behavior and animal nursing and so I wanted to combine photography and animals but I ended up doing videos and animals and I wish I knew whose video it was I watched but there was a guy talking about leopard geckos and he was like if you have a question let me know below and I'll make a video on it and I thought that's such a great idea I have so much to talk about about my geckos I have nobody to talk about about them though um maybe I could do something with that so that's sort of how that started and that was like your channel's been around for a while is that six or seven years ago uh yeah seven it'll be eight this year (laughs) yeah I I joined in October 2012 and I think I got my fourth leopard gecko in November. So I've, I've basically had the same four this entire time. Yeah, that I, I definitely want to talk about that because I find that uh, amazing as well, that you have a small number of, of animals and you have a lot of authority in, in, the, in that space as well, which is really cool. So in terms of the anxiety, and I don't want to dig down too far down this rabbit hole if, if you're not comfortable with it, but I'm curious, was like how difficult was it to start a YouTube channel if you were uncomfortable or if you had some social anxiety? Um, weirdly, it wasn't too bad. I remember my first video, I was like, just have my hands in it. Don't get any part of me in it. Uh, Watch out what you film in your bedroom. And I was so strict to myself, but it was more like an outlet. Like weirdly, I wasn't overly anxious. I could just talk. I could kind of be anonymous. And, um, I think that really helped to be honest. That's why I wasn't actually, I'm still not really in my videos. So yeah. Yeah, in, in terms, have you ever, you've never shown yourself in a video, is that right? Uh, no, well, to be fair, when I hit, I think, 2,000 subscribers, I did a giveaway, and I was actually in the video, but as soon as the giveaway was done, I deleted the video, <laughs> and then, yeah, I've just, no, I haven't been in a video since. Because that, that is what is so fascinating about your channel. Of course, there's um, so many great things, but you, you break a lot of rules when it comes to growing a big channel. Like one of those rules, the unknown rules is or unwritten rules is you need to be face to face with your audience and whatnot. And, and you have this amazing group of people that follow you and your channels, I think over 200,000 at this point, and you've never shown your face, which is really incredible. And <laughs> actually is it sort of a testament to the amount of the information that you're providing. Yeah, it's a weird one because I completely forget that people don't know what I look like so I've had comments saying oh there's been a few people who love that I do that but there's a few people that are like I can't connect with you I don't really watch the videos I listen to them but I don't see a person and that can be difficult because I'm like oh wait they don't actually know what I look like they haven't seen me Um, but weirdly it does seem to work with the majority of people and I'm not sure why 
but yeah. Well, you also have a, like a, a great accent and I know a lot of North Americans <laughs> could listen to an English accent forever and it's uh, so it definitely adds to it. But, but really it's the information that you provide and even just the way you talk through the videos is so super entertaining. So the fact that we don't see you is it's, you almost don't even realize when you're watching the videos. Yeah, it's the the funny thing is I was watching a video the other day. I think it was a guinea pig video, and the person she wasn't in her video, and I was like, why isn't she showing what she looks like? I wonder what she looks like. Is she in any other videos? I was like, oh my god, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that is literally what people must think about me. Oh, definitely. Yeah, like when people first find your channel, I did the same. You just try to scroll through a video to see if there's any that show you in it, and then you just go, oh, I guess not. <laughs> like you'll see kind of the back of your head type thing once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, I, and even like um, reflections in tanks, I have to be careful. Like, I, I'm just so strict on myself. I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> do you think one day you will do a face reveal? Um, I never say never, but I think the problem is where the channel keeps growing. You've obviously got this much bigger audience each time mm -hmm. that you're suddenly going to reveal your face to. And that's a little bit terrifying. Yeah, it slowly gets harder and harder as you as your channel grows. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of how your channel has evolved, you started with sort of care, mostly reptile or uh, I guess leopard gecko care, but you kind of have a sp sort of a, sm a smattering of a bunch of different topics throughout there. So how did it, when you started it, was it mostly going to be designed for leopard gecko care and then it sort of evolved from there? Uh, yeah, it it's weird because I feel like when I started off the channel, I was going to just do uh, leopard gecko stuff. But then as the channel went on, I, I started these little garden vlogs, which nobody watched. I filmed it on an iPod. Um, it was really bad. But I, I, cause I think when you're a much smaller channel, say you've got, I don't know, 10 subscribers, it doesn't really matter what you upload. You're just doing it for fun. Um, and so... I did the garden vlog that didn't last long <laughs> and I I got I started as the more the audience grew I was getting more questions where I had more things I could think about okay I'm gonna do a video on that this and that and I would just add in little projects that I was doing so I think someone in my family had brought me a sea monkey kit and I started um filming that and people seemed to really love that so that turned into a whole series of its own um but yeah, I do that now and again just to change things up. Was there a specific video that made your channel kind of grow at a faster rate or has it just been a steady trickle in from, you know, eight years ago? Um, it's definitely been a steady trickle in. One thing I did notice is a few years ago, I have an elephant hawk moth video. Mm -hmm. And in one month, I believe it was November, the video went from just this tiny little video to 500,000 views and I was like okay who shared this because this is ridiculous and I remember there was quite a bit of growth then but um I don't know what happened there but other than that it has just been trickling in the, the interesting thing about your channel is and, and I, I don't know if, do, do you consider yourself a pet tuber or do you hate that term uh, at first like term absolutely made me cringe yeah um, <laughs> most of the time when people refer to pet tubers a lot of them refer to people who have quite a variety of animals um i'm not often mentioned in them but i just don't think people know who i am that's probably why not but um i don't know i guess i could class myself as a pet tuber yeah it's one of those terms that kind of has like a uh dark side to it in a lot of ways there's a lot of kind of crazy pet tubers out there but the thing that's so interesting about your channel is you only have a, you have such a small amount of numbers uh, uh, animals and typically these people that create these big channels is they go out and they have you know 50 exotic animals and they feed all my exotic animal video blows up and, and everybody loves that and I actually don't like that because I think it, it it's a terrible message Same. to show to kids I think it just it's not realistic and it's not healthy for the animals but you only have like the how many how many animals do you have now? Uh, so with my reptiles, I have my four leopard geckos. I sort of started with uh, my crested gecko and my chihuahua, and then I have two guinea pigs and our family cat. Right, yeah. which is amazing. So it's like six or seven <laughs> animals, and yeah. you've still been able to grow. And I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm sure you're like me, where you don't like to see those massive collections of kind of a smattering of animals. Yeah, like when I started, there wasn't a lot of animal channels there was of course like animal bites or snake bites that was like a, that's quite an old channel like it's been going for ages so everyone sort of knows brian um 
But other than that, there weren't that many other animal channels. And it was only when I was trying to find like a decent name for my animal, I couldn't name my crested gecko. And I typed in all my pets because I thought people are going to go through their pets, going to tell them, uh, tell us what their name is, and I might be inspired. And that's when I found there's this whole different side of uh, the pet community that I had never even seen, where it's people saying like, uh, my new pet or uh, fifth, feeding 50 pets or all my 100 pets. And I'm like, I thought I had a lot. Like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you put, and this is probably a bad thing to say, although it's pretty obvious, if you put all my pets into the title of a video, it seems like the algorithm really likes that. And it's actually it's actually not good. <laughs> we don't want people yeah. to be buying a bunch of animals to be showing. And that's what's so interesting about your channel is you have this small, this small number. And it's almost like when I'm watching your videos, it's exciting to have the prospect of keeping just one. Like if I was a kid that didn't have a gecko yet, I would love to follow your channel and just see myself having one gecko that I just want to put as much energy into as possible rather than having this crazy collection. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you like this happens i think with every reptile person you can't stop at one mm -hmm. it's it's really difficult to um but i do like to show that you don't have to get tons like for me i know youtube isn't going to be probably a super long job and i wanted to also be able to function if i have to go out and get a normal nine to five and so having loads of exotics it wouldn't really be fair to them if things change so i always wanted it to be like just a normal size a normal amount of animals that I can interact with every day and I think I think well hopefully through my channel you also get to know the personalities of the geckos a lot more and people sort of have their favorites so yeah and yeah and it's so true it's it, I think a lot, too many people see YouTube as an actual career when you don't want to put all your eggs into the YouTube add a basket because who knows maybe one day they turn off monetization or something and you're left with 30 animals but it's it, it's an interesting thing and the thing that i really like about your channel and this is something that i talk about all the time on the podcast is teaching people that progression is what you want you don't have to start with this crazy advanced enclosure you can start super simple as long as your goal is to steadily increase your level of care and it seems like you've done that personally and you've also documented that over the last eight years and you've sort of taken your subscribers on that journey from how you started to where you are now and i, I absolutely love that can you Thanks. sort of see, talk about where you started in terms of your care, uh, things that you don't do or that you didn't do that you do now and, and vice versa and kind of how, where you are now? Yeah, so when I got my first gecko, obviously I was saving up loads of money and a lot of the stuff I got was secondhand. And I think that's a totally fine way to do things because obviously it can be quite daunting as long as you clean everything, you know, go secondhand and it's cheaper. Mm, I did the um, same. Uh, yeah. Um, so... I that was the tanks were quite simple one thing I didn't do was have a thermostat which is very bad but um, the heat mat I used maxed out about 32 degrees celsius um, and the heat mat was on a timer to go off at night but I wouldn't really recommend that now but obviously back then I don't know they weren't promoted that much thermostats like a lot of people said I'll oh, just do it on the timer it go off not on and off um and like another thing is I had some of my geckos in fornariums, which are OK. But looking back now, they were way too small. Um, but I think it's like I still have those videos up because I think it's good to show that journey on like how things are changing. You don't have to buy a leopard gecko and do a full blown bioactive tank straight away there. You can definitely take little steps and learn as you go. Um, but in terms of things like that I used to do that I don't do now, oh, UV is obviously, mm -hmm. obviously a big one. I was so against UV back in the day. So, so tell me about that because I think I was as well. And it's uh, this whole UV thing is kind of a, a new thing for, for the reptile world, especially for the nocturnal and crepuscular creatures. But do you remember why you were so adamantly opposed or, or was there like a source of information that you were pulling that from? Um, I think it's every every time I would look it up, it was leopard geckos. At the time, they were known as nocturnal. And then in your head, you're like, well, if they're asleep, they're not going to be exposed to UV, which is kind of stupid because I'm, I'm sure you've read John's book as well when he uh, mentions about if you fall asleep in the sun outside, do you not get sunburnt? Like, of course, you're still exposed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 
I, I don't know. I think also at the time, if I'm being honest, when I was looking things up, I was trying to find evidence that would support my own case, which is not a great way to research really and the only sort of opposing view I found was from Arcadia which is funny because obviously I do their adverts now and I'm a big fan of the brand and um, I love their work but at the time I thought well they're a light company they want to sell lights so they're gonna say they need lights so it just that 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 vision of you thinking that and then years later actually reading the <laughs> ads is really quite hilarious <laughs> yeah I just I remember like thinking yeah well they're a light company that's that's what they're going to sell but then having like spoken to John read the books done more research and then more information comes out you're like no they're actually doing this because they want the best for the reptiles this isn't something gimmicky and um yeah, like my own leopard geckos are evidence for me as well. They're happily lay under their UV and expose themselves. So, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, when, when you speak to John, it's it's impossible not to agree with him because he's so smart and he's done all the reading and research and he just knows exactly what he's talking about. You just, you, you can't disagree with it. Yeah, like I remember asking him, I was like, because I said I didn't use UV at the time. And I said, I, uh, you know, they're nocturnal, surely they're asleep. And then I got this email back, a massive paragraph explaining everything and all the research that's been done. I'm like, oh, wow, I think he might have a point. And I mm -hmm. think he sent me the book on MBD, uh, MBD, M yeah, MBD. It sounded weird mm -hmm. when I said it then. <laughs> um, and I read that and I was like, oh, wow, I think I think I might have to try this out. And uh, it changed like, everything. Yeah, it's it's funny when you communicate with John. He is I don't know how he has the time of day to do this, but when when he responds to an email, he gives you like a page of his book basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's just the the funny thing is like we'll talk and he'll give me so much information and and yet sometimes I'll get comments on my video about Arcadia products or something I've said that, that someone said, "Oh, that's wrong." And I'm like that's literally from a book from a guy that I, sp I spoke, uh, I speak to who knows a lot about the subject, but you know, someone who's just got a leopard gecko, someone in Petco told them they don't, they shouldn't have a UV light. So that's right. <laughs> so. What What is the argument for not having UV on the, is it their eyes or sun, like some sort of UV burn or, um, or is there most, an argument? Most of the time people will say, they'll still say they're nocturnal, which they're meant to be crepuscular, I believe. Uh, so they, in their heads, it's like, well, they're asleep, so they're hiding, so they wouldn't have anything, they wouldn't be in the sun. And also a lot of people are wary that it will hurt their eyes, which is something I genuinely was worried about before, um, but it doesn't seem to bother them, even my albinos. So when you first added UV, I'm sure you, you got the, the equipment from Arcadia. Were you skeptical at the time as well, or were you already thinking, like, this is what needs to happen? Um... I was excited, but I was still a bit skeptical. Like anything, anytime I introduce something new to my geckos, they're so like precious to me that I'm like, I don't want this to mess them up. Like I added the first one to Gizmo, my eldest gecko. So I'm like, okay, hopefully this is all good for her. And anytime you add anything new, whether it's like the UV or a different heater, you do notice it takes a few days for them to get used to it. And then she was just laying out on it. And I'm like, okay, she seems to be liking this. And I still, like, I didn't want to do a review and recommend it to every single person after using it for a very short time. So I wanted to really see how it works and how it affects different geckos. Um, but I must be, I must have been using it maybe three or four years now and they all use it and yeah, they seem really happy. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I did the same with my, my boas. I never had UV and then I added the Shade Dwellers just uh, maybe like three or four months ago. And it was really interesting um, how immediately they started basking underneath it. And and re very rarely they would they would be out in the day, uh, not in one of their hides. And all of a sudden they're just hanging out in the middle of the of the enclosure underneath the light. And it was, it's amazing that they just naturally n gravitate towards the the ultraviolet rays. Yeah, and I I love that the supplementing is so much easier as well. Like trying mm -hmm. to explain supplementing to people can be difficult. And even like when I was getting to know it, like luckily the breeder that I was getting my gecko from explained everything to me. But I always say, if you just get a UV light and you use like supplements like me, 
you, the gecko knows what it needs and it will expose how much of itself it needs to the light. Like it makes things so much easier. Yeah, it, it totally does. So in terms of supplementation, obviously you've thrown out vitamin D and then are you just using sort of like the Earth Pro A and then some calcium as well or? Yeah, yeah. And they seem to love that because sometimes you get vitamins and they turn their nose up to it straight away, like it smells weird or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I use and it works really well. Is there anything else that you've added to the care in terms of where you were five or six years ago to where you are now? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, heating wise I completely changed my mind I used to be once again really against overhead heating um and so I oh it was a recent book I think the fire book from Arcadia Mm -hmm. when I was reading that and getting to know more about the deep heat projector and everything because I'd I'd used it for a while my Cresta gecko and she doesn't really lay under it she just will pass it sometimes and it seems to be okay but it was mainly for like winter um, and I was skeptical about using it with my leopard geckos because I thought, what about belly heat? They need a heat mat. Um, and I used it and it completely transformed the way they just behave. So I used it with Ziggy, uh, my youngest leopard gecko, first. Uh, and because for so long, she would just stay in her cave. She'd sleep all the time. You didn't really see her much. And now I see her every day splooting on her rocks, fully exposed to UV as well. And so then I'm gradually introducing it to each of my geckos, but it is just one of those pieces of equipment that's completely changed the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess for those people who aren't aware of what it is, it's it's it just, it's almost like, it's, it's kind of like a ceramic heating element. I don't want to say that because I'm sure that would make John cringe, but it, <laughs> it, it's sort of the same sort of thing. It's emitting heat without emitting light, really. It's just these sort of two coils that emit infrared wavelengths. Yeah, I think if I remember rightly, the heat mat and ceramic heat emitter emits infrared C, mm-hmm. but the deep heat projector emits infrared A and B and also then C because that comes back off the rocks. So a lot when I first added it in, so many people were a little bit freaked out because I suddenly ditched the heat mat and everyone's worried about belly heat. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to do like two other videos explaining the science behind it and how my gecko's getting on. Because I think people are quite worried, but that, that's what you get with any sort of new technology that people aren't too familiar with. But yeah. Yeah, the, the concept of belly heat is everywhere. And, and of course, in the snake world as well, it's just this idea that they need heat coming from underneath. And I mean, what people don't realize is that the infrared wavelengths will penetrate right through the animal and they do warm the surface as long as it's a natural rock or wood or something. It's going to warm the surface beneath them. Yeah, I think it's similar to the UV as well. Like I almost try like I was thinking they don't have I, I don't want to use heat from above that isn't going to work because you have to use a heat map. But then I'm like, okay, but if they are actually in these caves or these little places hiding away, they haven't got a heat map. They are getting heat from above. So it was a lot of, it's weird. Before I do any videos, before I move on to any new piece of equipment, I really have to break down these old um, ideas of my own and think, actually, no, things have to change. And sometimes you can feel a little bit like embarrassed, like, oh, all this time I've been saying don't use UV don't use an over top heater and now that's exactly what I'm doing but if you know it's going to benefit the animal you just as well you know take the embarrassment with it well that's what that's what's so great about your channel is that growth is there and so often people on YouTube uh, just refuse to say they're wrong or say like hey I made a mistake or I didn't know enough about this to say what I did whatever and your channel is so perfect for that because it kind of takes you from really what we thought was appropriate care eight years ago and is still probably an okay way to start for sure if you're getting your first leopard gecko but then you can see the steps of progression up to where you are now with DP and uh, like a deep heat projector I don't have one but it's definitely on my list because I I I think that the idea of it is so cool and um, it's you know, it's just one added benefit to making more natural enrichment for the animal. Yeah. And you, you may see like a big difference, like with your reptiles moving around a lot more, not being restricted to just like a heat mat. Mm -hmm. Um, Mine are, mine's walking around at the moment, scratching on the glass as we speak, (laughs) but uh, yeah, it's a really good piece of equipment. Yeah, Yeah, it does. It does radiate the heat more. And and that's one of the other things too, is, when you do see the amount of equipment that gives you that sort of gold standard care, 
it might make people think, okay, I need to save up for money. I need, I need to save up enough money to buy this. I need to make sure that I have, you know, the right things in place, not just go out and get your tub with a paper towel and your leopard gecko. And then, and then you're thinking, okay, I only have to spend $30 to get this thing going. You do want people to see sort of how the care should be and the expense that comes with it. Yeah, it's a difficult one because I can sympathise with people who maybe are like 12, 13, like I was when I was getting a gecko, and it's not easy to come by uh, some money for this stuff. Like the dimming statues I use with the deep heat projector, I think cost me somewhere between 50 and 70 pounds. Like it's an expensive uh, piece of equipment. And so as much as I like to encourage people to do these, like try these new pieces of equipment, I also understand that not everyone can afford it, but they can still afford at least a decent uh house and set up for their animal at the moment Mm -hmm. yeah exactly and then lay out the path for when they're ready or when they have the extra dollar what's the first purchase that can come through maybe it's the substrate and whatnot so so let's let's chat a little bit about leopard gecko care just just the basics because leopard geckos are such an a mainstay in the hobby and they've been around for so long that they do come along with all these myths like we've been talking like you got the sand and everything so what are some of those major common mistakes you see all the time with with people's leopard gecko care um so oh, there's there's a few that reoccur like number one would be i used to get so much people be like so i put my male and my female together and they've been living together they're fine they're brother and sister mm. um but um now my female's laying eggs and 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 I'm like, how do you not know that if you put a male and female together, things are going to happen? They're like, yeah, but they're brother and sister. I was like, that does not matter with these no, geckos. No. <laughs> um, so you get uh, co having uh, quite a bit. And I think there's still a lot of debate over that because sometimes people can get two girls together and it works for a bit. So they would say you can do it. But that happens a lot. Uh, the lack of supplements sometimes happens and you'll get um, – quite mangled gecko and someone's like why has this happened and you find out they've never even heard about supplements um i've i've seen less people use sand and calcium sand which is nice to see um yeah that whole desert theme is starting to dwindle it seems like but even if you go back four or five years ago leopard geckos were a desert dwelling species it seemed like yeah well i i did a review recently on I think it was a pet smart kits that they were bringing out and I think some of them were still quite desert themed and stuff like that it's uh, another thing I do see quite a bit is when people have bought uh pets from uh Petco or pet smart and they're like oh it's okay it was a ten dollar gecko and but now it's really skinny and it's not eating and I'm like you might have to take it to the vets because if it has a parasite or something and then they're like oh I can't afford the vet Mm-hmm. Or, or or they get like two geckos and they think they're going to be fine I so you have to split them up and they say I can't afford that and it's 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 annoying because I wish I could help but I can't and um that happens quite a bit mm. um in situations like that but yeah yeah there's only so much you can do and so in terms of uh, just the basic care so what about a uh, food how are, how are you feeding your your geckos on a regular basis so as they're all adults I usually tend to feed them like every three or four days um at the moment all three girls are carrying eggs even though they've never been bred with they just do this every year so they're eating occasionally they uh, for some reason this time of year they don't really like crickets they're really into just worms um so at the moment that's kind of what they're getting that's actually another myth that goes around with reptiles is that if you feed them a mealworm, it's going to eat their stuff through their stomach. I don't know if you've heard that one before. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, I get that quite a lot. Of people ask me if that's okay to feed them that. Um, and yeah, one, oh, that's another thing. Gut loading the food and supplementing the food. Um, a lot of people say to me, well, I'm tipping all these mealworms, you know, from the tub they bought them from why is it my gecko putting on weight? Why is it not looking great? And it's like, they haven't been gut loading or dusting. Um, so they're two things I really like to focus on and just offering a variety of insects, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you're right, some, a lot of times geckos will just turn the nose up to one for a while. And then like my day gecko will sometimes eat crickets, but a lot of times she won't. But sometimes she'll eat like a ton of them and then she'll give up on them for months at a time. It's really strange. 
Yeah, it's a bit like my crested gecko and my chihua. Like, and the other thing is they don't hunt in the same way as the leopard geckos. They don't necessarily stalk the food. They just stare at it for ages and suddenly randomly decide to eat it if they want to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you what do you gut load your mealworms with? Uh, so it's usually vegetable scraps because I have guinea pigs. I'm always chopping up their food, and any ends and that I will pop in with uh, all my feeder insects that have a variety. Um, I used to use, I think, oats with my mealworms, but then I had like loads of mold because there wasn't enough ventilation, I think, and uh, some old food had sort of gone a bit wet, which made the oats wet, which got mold, and then I just moved away from using that. <laughs> so, do you keep meal? You don't keep mealworms in a, in a sort of oats at all, or are they just kind of on their own? Uh, so, usually from the shops, they come in this sort of. Uh, I think it's called bug grub. I think that's what it is. But I mix it in with a bit of earth mix arid if I have a little bit left over. Got it. Um, yeah, that's what I use now. That's obviously not really a cheap option. <laughs> so I totally understand why people use oats. It's just if I have a little bit left in the bag that I use it for them. But I find the thing with the oats is they eat the oats over the vegetables a lot of times. Like I'll, I'll throw scraps into my mealworms as well. And a lot of times it's hard for them to they, they it's almost like they'd rather eat the oats so i wonder if that's what i should do is pull them out of the oats and let them and maybe make their own kind of substrate and that force them to eat the veggies uh yeah i mean i like i remember someone a while ago told me this any sort of cereal based thing or oats could be well once they told me it's bad for them, but then I looked into it more and it wasn't. So I don't really know what to believe. But I know that whenever I put vegetables in, you just see heaps of mealworms on it. So yeah, maybe maybe oats are just tastier. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, but, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so anyway, in terms of uh, enclosure wise, what do you what do you say is sort of the minimum enclosure for an adult leopard gecko? Um. So I would say a two foot long tank. I know in America you like have gallons and I, I never really understand them. But most of the time you just say 20 gallons, but of course a 20 gallon long uh, is better than like a tall one. Um, so I would say that's a minimum. A lot of people have 10 gallon tanks and to me, they're just too small. It's way too small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And once you, once you start adding in those extra things like a, proper heating and lighting and you start seeing them move around the enclosure all of a sudden you're like wow this is too small yeah um and yeah some of the hides alone like i recently did a tank review and i think someone had a 10 gallon tank or maybe a 20 gallon and their hides were quite big which is great but the tank seemed so tiny um and if you were, really want to make a house a home you you've got to have a bit more room for them to move in yeah, and one of the things that you've recently done with uh, the custom reptile habitat enclosure, which is this massive, is that three feet long or? Uh, yeah, three foot by two foot by two foot. And the really cool thing about that is you actually get to utilize that vertical space, which I think a lot of people don't realize leopard geckos will actually use vertical space if you set it up properly. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people noticed it when they have uh, the like the exoterra tanks with the foam backgrounds because people be like, I hear the squeaking and a gecko's climbing up it. There's their little <laughs> nails in there. Yeah, um, yeah. But when I was doing my wooden vivariums, I got backgrounds that have ledges on because I know they will actually climb up and I want them to be able to rest. And then when I got the custom reptile habitats one, they had a similar type of background. So I really like that because I... I know my geckos will climb and also for some reason, I don't know if you notice this with any of your reptiles, but they will literally find the highest point away from where they sleep to go to the toilets. And uh, yeah, at the yeah. moment in their tanks, it's quite annoying, but hopefully in this big tank, Diego, the gecko who's going to be moving in, finds an appropriate place. Yeah. And that was, is that your first attempt at a bioactive leopard gecko enclosure? Yeah, I, I did one where... I wanted it to be naturalistic and at first I did try to put succulents in it and then I realized well I haven't actually put a drainage layer or a growth light in it so of course the plants didn't really do anything so that was a bit of a fail but um so this time round I was much more prepared and sort of determined to make something that would actually function. And at, at this time he, Diego is not in that enclosure yet right you're still waiting for it to sort of uh, establish? Yeah, so I'm trying to add in 
a cleanup crew. I've been adding in springtails, um, but <laughs> I thought they were all living under the fake rocks because it's more humid under there. And I lifted one up the other day and they're, they're disappeared. I don't know where they are. Um, so I'm going to have to keep adding in springtails, keep part of the tank somewhat moist so they can, they'll be okay, but it won't affect the overall humidity. And I'm still trying to make sure that the grasses in the tank do well because when I first put them in they did dry out quite a bit and they all started to curl up and I was like oh god so um I I want everything to be perfect before he moves in yeah adding the plants to the equation definitely adds a challenge for sure is what is the the humidity range for leopard geckos ideally it has to be 40 percent or below but it, it can go up a little bit when they're about to shed because you see so many geckos with stuck shed on their toes and so you must you think it must have to get slightly more humid for that to be able to just slip off like normal one thing i have noticed though is in my tanks where i have deep heat projectors if i miss down the uh, substrate when i see they're about to shed that that just slips off so i don't know what the deep heat projector does to to, to make that happen but they rarely ever get any stuck shed huh um, but when I first announced I was going to do a bioactive tank, there were some people who said, you can't do a bioactive tank. You can't do it for leopard geckos. They're from an arid environment that doesn't work. I don't really understand the logic there because there are actual arid biomes in the wild. <laughs> like these things exist. Um, and I think because of the size of the tank and the ventilation, it, re- the hu- it doesn't affect the humidity too much. Yeah, that it, when people think bioactive, they automatically think tropical, but you can certainly do arid. And it's actually such an interesting challenge because you do still need to water the plants. Although the plants that you put into them don't necessarily need every, you know, daily waterings, right? You're only watering these things every few days, probably, or every week, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So like with my other bioactive tanks like Cresta Gecko and Chihua, I spray that down every day for them anyway, but also the plants in there. So like the pothos um, and whatever plants I choose to go in there they tend to want a lot of water whereas the grass I chose it does like a a fair bit but not, nothing like my crested geckos plants so it's all good yeah so I do you have plans for when Diego's gonna get to move into his great new home um so I'm hoping sometime this month but we just have to see how the plants do and if I can get those springtails up because I definitely want to see him move in he when I first put him in I thought okay this would just be for 10 minutes he ended up spending an hour and a half in there (laughs) and he looks so sad when I put him back (laughs) so um, I would love to see him move in another thing though that I have to do is I'm gonna have to leave the deep heat projector on for like about a week before he moves in to really start heating up those rocks because I'm using such thick slate that um it takes a while to get everything properly heated (laughs) Right. Interesting. I never thought about that. So in terms of, the, do you leave the deep heat projectors on all the time or do they come off at night? Uh, no, I keep them on all the time. It would be good if I could like get them to go down a little bit at night because obviously in the wild, it, the temperature might drop a bit. But equally, I guess if the geckos are too warm, they will go to the cold side. So that's a benefit of having the colder side. Yeah, exactly. They can kind of choose what they want. So uh, one of the interesting things that you do on your channel that I think your followers love is you react to their their setups so tell me about how this started and kind of what it is um so i i think someone on instagram said to me you should like review people's setups and i said yeah but i don't know i don't want to be someone who says this is right this is wrong you need to do it this way that way and he said no you just have to give people pointers and i was like "Mm, okay i'll think about it so um I can't even remember. I don't think I hadn't seen anyone do it in the pet community before. I've seen things where people um, have been like reacting to my viewers, I don't know, makeup looks and stuff like that. But I hadn't seen it done with animals or setups. So I just put out a post on Instagram saying that's what I was looking to do. And people seem to really respond to it. So I've now done, I think, 10 episodes of it. But yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You basically just look at a, a photo that they've sent you. And, and you also are really good at, is it Photoshop you use or what's the program oh, yeah. you use? Oh, that's Photoshop? Yeah. 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 So you're incredible on that program because it's really cool. You get to, you know, you, you add like the plants and, and everything. And, and it seems like 
it's it's not like one of those things where you roast your your followers in closures. You're actually giving them really helpful tips. And it's also super good for people who are coming in and don't have a gecko yet and are trying to learn what, what the setup should look like. Yeah, that's one thing that really worried me. I thought I really don't want to say anything that would insult anyone or put anyone off because if you are willing to like send in your setup you and you're excited to maybe see it in a video, the last thing you want is someone going, what have you done here? This is hideous. Like I never wanted to do anything like that. I just wanted to just some friendly pointers here and there. Like you do see some setups where I've seen one where this gecko had no hides. There was just sand and a red light in this massive tank. And I was like, okay, I have to feature this just to explain everything that's wrong with this because it can't I can't just ignore that that is really bad yeah yeah it's interesting it, so what what about leopard geckos do you enjoy is that too general of a question <laughs> <laughs> um I it's it's so bizarre I feel like even when I see leopard geckos in shops I feel a level of like responsibility like I just feel like I don't know they're just really cute they have a lot I feel like they have a lot of personality and um they're very easy to sort of tame and i mean some like sometimes mine will even come when you call them so i it's I, it's hard to explain why i'm so drawn to them but yeah it, it's interesting what with because they are such a you know a mainstay in the hobby i think they kind of had their peak and a lot of people don't go towards them because they don't want a leopard gecko because it's what everybody has. You know, I don't want to get like a typical gecko, but for some reason, when I watch your channel, it makes me really want a leopard gecko. Like there's just, it, you just highlight them in a way that sort of revives them almost as a species in the hobby in a way. Yeah. It's, um, it's a weird one. Cause I was talking to someone in a shop and she, she asked me what geckos I had. And it was like a leopard geckos and crested gecko and who are quite like normal geckos. And she had a, they're like five Fermi pythons and toke geckos and I'm like oh she goes I like a challenge and I'm like yeah I have quite sort of tame sort of maybe basic geckos um but yeah I I think a lot of people obviously when they get into the hobby a leopard gecko is that beginner gecko or beginner reptile so people are quite interested in them my only concern is like they might get a leopard gecko to introduce them to reptiles. But then leopard geckos live for like 20 years or more. So they're going to have them for a long time. Also getting on with like chameleons or monitors or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, and, and crested geckos are the same. It's, it's weird that it's a starter pet for a lot of kids, but people don't realize necessarily how long they live. Like you could have a gecko for 25 years. Yeah. Like Gizmo, I've now had her half my life. I think that's why I feel so close to leopard geckos because when you've had them this long, mm -hmm. it's they're just part of your daily life. It's um crazy. But strangely enough, when I first got into leopard geckos, I hadn't even heard of a crested gecko. And it was only just from doing YouTube and obviously getting other uh reptile videos recommended to me that I started to learn more and more about crested geckos and I they're just adorable i love crested geckos yeah yeah when i first got my crested gecko they were it seems like they were just coming onto the mainstream pet market like that I, I remember i was looking up anoles like that's what really the only thing I, I thought i could get and crested geckos were just coming on and that was i think in the mid 2000s and i still have that same gecko it's like these things stick around forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's um it's funny because because i had been so used to leopard geckos and how they acted when I was researching crested geckos most of the videos I saw were from either breeders or people who had crested geckos as part of a bigger collection and they didn't like handle them very irregularly and so they were just jumping everywhere and I was so scared that I'd get one that you open the door and it jumps out like a frog or something and I was like what if I can't handle this and it doesn't stay still and I was so anxious but then actually when I had it myself I realized you put in that time they are just perfectly fine to handle they don't jump too much maybe the babies do but um the yeah they're great little pets yeah no they, they're and they're an awesome easy pet for kids to start with as well one of the other interesting videos on your channel that i want to ask you about is the the video that you sort of directed towards petco did i guess for those that haven't seen it basically you're just or did a viewer send you a clip of of them interacting with the sales associate i kind of forget yeah um, because I was saying that I was planning on doing a video and 
for like for years I was getting videos and pictures of these geckos in Petco and I was just enraged I didn't know how this was allowed to go on and I didn't really want to do a video where I'm just sat there ranting on about it I wanted to do it properly with all the relevant information and when I was making that video someone said hey I recorded this uh when I went into Petco so I included that and I think I think if I remember correctly the person gave them a care sheet for house geckos or something whilst talking about leopard geckos and it's just oh uh, yeah. yeah, basically the the sales associate was just really clearly did not know how to care for the leopard gecko and and uh, she was giving horrible advice and, and sort of a typical experience that you might have going into one of these big box stores. But that that video has a lot of views. It's over a million views. I wondered if did that did they ever respond to that in any way or did you ever hear from them? No, surprisingly not. They actually followed my channel for a long time way before that as well. Oh, really? Um, yeah, which is kind of scary because I was like, why is Petco following me? Um, but they've never reached out or anything. I did hear that some stores had improved a bit, but you still get those ones that are still a bit bad. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I thought they might reach out to you and try to patch that. So was it was their YouTube channel subscribed to your YouTube channel? Yeah, it's <laughs> <is> really weird. <laughs> yeah, that is very interesting. They should at least watch your videos and get some advice on how to care for these guys. Yeah, I, I like I've heard from some people who have said that, that like they sort of know higher up people and maybe PetSmart and they are aware of YouTubers videos, including my own. So it's just a shame that sometimes they don't apply some of the information to how they're keeping the animals in the stores. Yeah, it would just be very easy to create a care sheet or even give your channel out to people that are buying. Like, I don't see why they wouldn't do that. It's not like they're losing anything. Yeah, yeah. How did, and tell me about how you got involved with Arcadia. We kind of mentioned it before that you do read their ads now. Did they mm. just kind of approach you and ask if, or did you already do voiceover work in some capacity? I think it started, I was doing a Crested Gecko bioactive tank and I was asking around about what sort of lighting I needed to use and everyone recommended the Jungle Dawn. So I got in touch with Arcadia and um, I did a review on the Jungle Dawn and we sort of spoke for quite a few years after initially uh, talking about the Jungle Dawn and everything, I would always keep in touch. And then they just re reached out to me and said, do you want to help us out with doing a few ads here and there? And I think I must, be, I've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, and yeah, it's just sort of, I've been part of the team, which is really nice. So do you just record those at home? They, they give you the script, you record it and then send it to them? Um, so... Yeah, I record the audio. I record most of the footage unless they're able to get some of the animals at the Arcadia HQ. And then I edit it all together and upload it for them. Oh, I see. So you actually do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's very cool. I mean, it's it's funny hearing. I shouldn't say funny. Funny is the wrong word. But <laughs> your, your voice is so distinguishable that when you're watching the, the Arcadia ads, you're like, hey, wait a minute. This is a leopard gecko voice. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, some so some people um, do say to me, "You sound really familiar." Is have you done the like adverts for Arcadia? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I think the other thing is sometimes um, people think that I am sort of part of Arcadia in the way that I get some sort of benefit from promoting any of their products, which I don't like. I I sometimes get questions about their products as if I the actual company um but yeah if i promote something i don't there's no no paid ad or anything like that right yeah i guess that makes sense if they they hear you advertising it so they assume you're linked to the company in some kind of as an employee or something but you're just creating the ads and and they do have amazing products so it's hard not to use their products yeah that that's the thing like i wouldn't want to promote anything to anyone if i thought it wasn't good or if i didn't really use it so it's tricky because you get some people like this is clearly a paid promotional it really isn't i'm getting nothing for this i just think it's really good <laughs> yeah it's they're they're one of those brands and for some reason reptile brands a lot of times i approach them with some skepticism i'm like a lot of these products don't seem like they're necessary and these these care kits that they're that they're putting together don't make any sense and and but arcadia i just trust everything that they put out every type of food every piece of light it's like i feel like i don't even have to do the research myself i can just go buy it and i feel com comfortable with it 
Yeah, the like I think you find that with um, reptile companies, like you'll have quite a few bad experiences with something, and you're like, you know what, I'm not even going to try anything else. Everything's gone wrong. Whereas, yeah, like it, it's funny. Like I have done uh, adverts on their channel for I think it's a flower boost for like tortoise, but because I don't have tortoise and I haven't used it myself, I'm not promoting that, and I'd feel like that would be crossing the line a bit if I was trying to promote something I haven't even tried but yeah anything I try with them and my leopard geckos generally is really good so I'll happily just promote it anyway yeah no they are a fantastic brand so in terms of your future plans do you have anything on the table for your channel or do you have a kind of an idea where you want it to go or you just take it video because you actually put a video out fairly regularly yeah I try to aim for every four days um, there was a point where it was every day, but in fairness, I wasn't actually going out anywhere. Like, as we mentioned about my anxiety, I literally couldn't leave the house. So my life was just, let's do a video every single day. Um, but I, I rein it in a bit. Um, you know, I do four every four days. Um, but one quite exciting thing that's happening is we're in the middle of buying a house, which is a bit awkward because everything's on lockdown at the moment. So everything's on hold. Um, but our second bedroom is going to be a reptile room. And so I'm hoping to expand all the geckos cages. Hopefully we might have a few new additions in the future, like quite spread out. I'm not going to suddenly move out and get like 20 more pets. Um, um, but it will give me a bigger area to work in and hopefully just do more bioactive tanks. And like, I, I'm quite a fan of, uh, Serpa Designs channel um, yeah and like he has so many cool little projects that I'd love to do if I had the room so um, whether I do them on YouTube or just off of it like it would just give me a lot more room to do more things yeah I was supposed to my fiance and I were trying to buy a house this summer as well and now I, I don't know what's going to happen because everything is so in limbo it seems like but I, I'm just craving to have a house one day so I have more space and a garage to do projects and and uh, it yeah. just the freedom to be able to do more things yeah like even because my house we currently like in lockdown we have five adults in here and it's not even a proper house i don't know if you have bungalows in america do you, do yeah you we do yeah. yeah so it's a really little place and everywhere's full of everything so trying to find an area just like a background to film on can be difficult and i'm just like i need some space um and yeah, like right now, we are basically one step away from getting the keys to the house. But because nobody can go back to work, we are just sort of waiting. <laughs> so it's a bit annoying. Yeah, yeah, just stuck in limbo. And are you yeah. able to make YouTube kind of your full time thing? I know you mentioned that you may go out and get a job but right now. Is YouTube what you're doing it for, for income or do you have another career job uh, on the go? Uh, fortunately, at the moment, this is uh, what I do all the time. Um, but of course I always feel like I should, I should be prepared to get like a normal job. I'm very fortunate at the moment I can still do this, um, as a full-time job. I do obviously do like some video editing and stuff, but, um, yeah, this is mainly it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, once you buy a house, it's one of those where you, you may end up needing some more income, but who knows, maybe you'll have more more time to put more videos out and, and, and grow the channel even more with uh, you know the, an extra yeah. room and whatnot. Well, that's the thing with YouTube. It's, it's, it's not really consistent. You don't know if things are going to go really well and you're going to get more money next year or less, or suddenly you know YouTube's going to demonetize everything and then you're like, oh, wow, I really need to go out and get a job. Um but it's a bit unpredictable. But also, like, in times like this, I can still do it. And it hasn't, like, affected me too much this lockdown. Like, I I just get to carry on doing what I usually do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm coming to the same. All of a sudden, I can put out more content because I have more time in my day to do that. So in some ways, it can be a, a benefit. But uh, anyway, Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining me. This is a really great conversation. I, I felt like I was watching one of your videos the whole time because <laughs> your voice is ringing in my ears. It's awesome. Uh, can you let everybody know where they can find you online? Yes, yeah, so you can find me on uh, youtube.com slash leopardgeckotalk. Um, and I also have uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The Instagram's leopardgecko YouTube, same with Facebook. And Twitter is LGT YouTube because most other handles are taken. <laughs> but that's the best way to 
uh, find me. Awesome. And I will have everything in the show notes for everybody to go find. So definitely go give it a follow. If you're not already, I'm sure many of you are. So Rebecca, thank you very much. That was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, that brings us to the end of episode number 49. Rebecca, thank you very much for stopping by. I had a blast chatting with you. To the listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you are interested in expanding your leopard care knowledge, go to Leopard Gecko YouTube channel. Rebecca will teach you everything you need to know. I'm pretty sure she has a video on every single topic when it comes to leopard gecko care and more. So it's absolutely worth a sub. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you do go check out their website through one of my affiliate links and you end up making a purchase, a small commission does come back to me, which helps support the show. If you want to support the show in other ways, you can give the podcast a five-star rating on the Apple Podcasting app. You can also share the content on social media or head to animalsathome.ca and pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater and $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I will catch you guys next week.